Hello class, this is Daniel Bowerman, here with the second recording of the lecture on eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and eigenspaces. So first, we'll need to define those three terms. So given a linear operator T, the eigenspace of T corresponding to a chosen scalar C, denoted by E sub C of T, is the kernel of the operator T minus the scalar C times the identity operator. If the dimension of that space is greater than zero, then the scalar C is an eigenvalue of T. Any non-zero member X of that space E sub C of T is an eigenvector of T corresponding to C. And the pair scalar C and vector X is an eigenpair of T. However, so even though we have tend to define bilinear operators first in this class, many people tend to want to work with matrices more so when it comes to eigenpairs. So they will refer to eigenpairs of matrices rather than linear operators. The eigenvalues of an n by n matrix A are the same as the linear operator T acting on C to the n that A is a representation of. So to find the eigenvalues of A, you can find the eigenvalues of T, which is just the linear operator made by multiplying the vector by a on the left and you can have your values in c to the n not just real numbers the eigenspace of a corresponding to a scalar lambda is the null space of the matrix a minus lambda times the identity matrix and non-zero elements x of the space are eigenvectors of a corresponding to lambda and thus eigenpairs are still of the form scalar lambda and vector x and an additional note, I will be referring to the book in this lecture several times, and all references to the book are references to Linear Algebra and its Applications, 5th edition by David C. Lay, Stephen R. Lay, and Judy J. MacDonald, mainly section 5.1 of that book. So we will work through some example problems now, and these are corresponding directly to example problems from the section that I referred to 5.1 in the book above. And in the book, they do more with matrix, matrix techniques and matrix eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but we will do them with linear operators instead. And we, the answers will be the same, and so you can get to see multiple different ways of doing that, doing these problems. So if we let A be the matrix 1, 6, 5, 2, u be the vector 6, negative 5, and v be the vector 3, negative 2. We ask the question, are u and v eigenvectors of the linear transformation t represented by a? And to do this, we solve for if they are an element of, of a kernel of one of the operators above t minus some scalar c times the identity operator i. And so we'll do that here. We will solve for t minus c times i acting on the vector u, 6, negative 5. And we find that we get 6 minus 30 minus c times 6 and 30 minus 10 plus c times 5. That vector is equal to 0. So we get two equations from that, negative 24 minus c times 6 equals 0 and 20 plus c times 5 equals 0. So we end up with c times 6 equals negative 24, and c times 5 equals negative 20. So the, the value that we find is that c equals negative 4, and thus 6, negative 5 is an element of the kernel of t plus 4i. And so 6, negative 5 is an eigenvector of t, because it is in an eigenspace of t and is non-zero. So next we will solve for v, for v using the same technique, t minus ci acting on 3, negative 2, equals 0, 0. So we have two equations, 3 minus 12 minus c times 3 equals 0, and 15 minus 4 plus c times 2 equals 0. So solving those quickly, we see that c has to be negative 3 and c has to be negative 11 halves. So there is no C that follows, that allows both of these equations to be true. And thus there is no C that allows for this top equation to be true. So three negative two is an element of kernel T minus CI, never. 
and thus 3, negative 2 is not an eigenvector of t. Uh, example 3 is also from the book and is similar in a way. We, sh we show that 7 is an eigenvalue of t from example 2, so t is represented by a, and thus it is also an eigenvalue of a in example two and find the corresponding eigenvectors. So first, using linear operators, we just solve t minus seven i of x uh, acting on x1, x2 equals zero, zero, because that will mean that x1, x2 is in the kernel of this operator here. And we find that x1 plus six x2 minus seven x1 equals zero, and five x1 plus two x2 minus seven x2 equals zero. So we end up, these two equations give us 6x2 equals 6x1, and 5x1 equals 5x2. So we have two essentially redundant equations. So x1 and x2 are in the kernel of the operator t minus 7i, if and only if x1 equals x2, and since we can find an example vector 1, 1 in the kernel that is non-zero, the dimension of the kernel of t minus 7i is greater than zero, and thus 7 is an eigenvalue of t, and thus of a as well. And so example 4, which is also from five, section 5.1 of the book, it, we will do this with both linear operator and matrix methods, just to show how you can get the same result from either way and the different techniques that you could do. But first, we let the, vector, we let the matrix a equal 4, negative 1, 6, 2, 1, 6, and 2, negative 1, 8. An eigenvalue of A, and thus of the linear operator T represented by A, is 2. Find bases of the corresponding eigenspaces of both the linear operator T and the matrix A, and we'll do it with both methods. So first we're looking for elements of the kernel of T minus 2i, so t minus 2i acting on x1, x2, and x3 equals 0, 0, 0, implies three separate equations, 4x1 minus x2 plus 6x3 minus 2x1 equals 0, 2x1 plus x2 plus 6x3 minus 2x2 equals 0, and 2x1 minus x2 plus 8x3 minus 2x3 equals 0. So, when you actually calculate that out, it turns out that two of these are redundant equations because they all end up simplifying to 2x1 minus x2 plus 6x3 equals 0. And thus we have two free variables and one that will be defined by our choices of those two free variables. So we can choose x1 and x3 to be free, mainly because I don't want to work with fractions, and we can define x2 to be equal to 2x1 plus 6x3. So our x1, x2, x3 is of the form x1, 2x1 plus 6x3, x3, which we can separate to x1 times the vector 1, 2, 0, plus x3 times the vector 0, 6, 1 for arbitrary x1 and x2. This shows that there is an obvious basis here, being the vector 1, 2, 0, and the vector 0, 6, 1. So a basis for that eigenspace of the, which is the kernel, t minus 2i, is 1, 2, 0, and 0, 6, 1. So the linear operator t, acting on the vector x1, x2, x3, is equivalent to multiplying x1, x2, x3 by a on the left. So we can find a basis for the eigenspace of the matrix directly, as the eigenspace of a is the null space of a minus 2i, which is a matrix which is the null space of 4, negative 1, 6, 2, 1, 6, 2, negative 1, 8, minus 2, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 2, which is just 2 times the identity matrix, which is equal to the null space of 2, negative 1, 6, 2, negative 1, 6, 2, negative 1, 6. So we can simply find a basis for this space. So we row reduce the new matrix A minus 2i, and we thought by subtracting the first row from rows 2 and 3, and then dividing the first row by 2, we find that we have our matrix 1, negative 1 half, and 3, and then two rows of zeros. 
So we have only one equation to look at from here. We have x1 minus 1 half x2 plus 3x3 equals 0. So we can choose x2 and x3 to be free, and we find that x1 equals 1 half x2 plus 3x, or sorry, minus 3x3. So all elements of the null space of a minus 2i are of the form 1 half x2 minus 3x3, x2, x3, which we can separate like we did above to find that we have an obvious basis of 1 half 1, 0, and negative 3, 0, 1, and they're multiplied by arbitrary, arbitrary variables. So we find that these two bases describe the same subspace because the eigenspace of the operator acting on C to the N and the eigenspace of the, of the matrix will be the same thing. And we see that because we get this first vector from this first vector just by multiplying this vector by 2. So 2 times 1 half 1, 0 equals 1, 2, 0. And 6 times 1 half 1, 0 plus negative 3, 0, 1 equals 0, 6, 1, which is this vector. So we can find these vectors from each other. And that will show that those two describe the same subspace. And now we'll be working on a theorem for like the next 10 minutes. So <laughs> this one is a bit more, diff it's a bit of an interesting, in interesting induction proof. And it will be using a lot more matrix notation and matrix techniques than we've been doing in the class. Mainly because this theorem deals with upper triangular and lower triangular matrices, which while they do correspond to linear operators, there's not a category of upper triangular linear operators that anyone really cares about. However, we'll just start by stating the theorem. Theorem one from section 5.1 of the book, the eigenvalues of a triangular matrix, upper or lower, are the values of the entries on the main diagonal, which are simply the entries on the diagonal starting in the upper left and going to the bottom right. And since eigenvalues only make sense on square matrices, that diagonal will account for the whole length and height of that matrix. So proof, we will prove the result for upper triangular matrices with no repeated values in the main diagonal. And we prove the result for these cases because, well, for the no repeated values, we end up doing some division that would be very nasty if we had to. If we had uh, repeated values and we could end up dividing by zero. And there are ways around that, it's just even longer. And we don't need to take up that much time on this one proof. And the upper triangular is simply because you could do a lower triangular with a very, very similar argument and it doesn't really matter that much. It's just uh, <clears throat> people tend to do upper triangular as the default triangular matrix. But you could do something like prove this thing, prove using a similar technique to how we did here, you could prove it for lower triangular matrices with no repeated values if you want to. No one probably will, but okay. So first we'll define our A sub N, so our N by N matrix, which is upper triangular. And we just index the entries that are non-zero by where they are in the, <laughs> in the matrix. We have A11, A12, all the way to A1N, and then zero, A22, all the way to A2N, and then the bottom row is all zeros except for A and N. And then we start our induction proof. We have the k equals 1 case, so we let a sub 1 equal the matrix that is a single element, a11. So for any 1 by 1 vector, this is not absolute value of x, the vector x equals the vector of just x. a1 times the vector x is just a11 times the vector of x, so we can combine those to get the vector of just a11x which is just equal to the scalar a11 times the vector of x, which is equal to, the, to a11 times the vector x. So a11 is the only eigenvalue of a1. So for our inductive argument, which takes up the majority of this proof, we, have, we can assume that the result holds for all n-1 by n-1 upper triangular matrices with no repeated values. And we don't need anything smaller than n minus 1 by n minus 1, so it's not a fully, completely inductive proof. But we take the upper left n minus 1 by n minus 1 submatrix of a sub n. So we're cutting out this row, sorry, this column and this row. 
and we're just leaving this, which is also upper triangular. So we have A11 through A1, N minus 1, 0, A22 through A2, N minus 1. And then the bottom row is zeros all the way to N, A, N minus 1, N minus 1. The eigenvalues of A, N minus 1 are A11 through A, N minus 1, N minus 1 by inductive assumption, inductive hypothesis here. Each has at least one corresponding non-zero eigenvector x1 through xn minus 1, respectively. And so here we're going to do a bit of manipulation with vectors and matrices, and we'll show that some multiplications are equivalent. So for each xi, define xi as entry-wise. So we have xi1 through xi n minus 1, because these are n minus 1 by 1 vectors. So a n minus 1 xi. Because these are eigenvectors, we end up seeing that they have, they're just xi times a specific scalar, in this case, aii, multiplied out front. And that's due to the fact that this is in the null space of an minus aii times uh, the, identity, the identity matrix of n minus 1 times n minus 1 dimensions. So define xi0 as xi with an extra 0 at the bottom. And that makes it an n by 1 vector, so we can multiply it on the right of a n. And doing so, we see that this 0 will cancel out everything in this column here. So it doesn't come into effect. So we just end up multiplying these same scalars when in combination with these same scalars here. And that ends up equivalent to this, which ends up equivalent to multiplying the top entries by AII again. And since 0 is equal to AII times 0, we can pull an AII out front of the x i 0. So each AII is an eigenvalue of A sub n for 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n minus 1. So every, all of these eigenvalues are still the same, basically, from the AN minus 1. So now we're just trying to show that this last entry, this last diagonal entry, is an eigenvalue as well. And we will do that through a bit more of a linear operator's sense, where it's just a large collection of equations that we have to solve. And to show that a n n is an eigenvalue, we only need to show that a n minus a n n i x has a non-zero solution x, and thus the dimension of the null space of a n minus a n n i is greater than zero. And I apologize, these are supposed to be curly braces because the null space is a functional argument, not a, this isn't supposed to be a set, it's an entry to a function. And so we continue the proof again, and we will just look at these equations that result from setting this value equal to zero, which also is supposed to be there. So by doing that, we see that we have a11 minus a n n x1 plus a12 x2 plus a13 x3 plus dot 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 whatever dot plus a1 n x n equals zero. You've got a22 minus a n n x2 plus a23 x3 plus a bunch of dots plus a2 n x n equals zero, and then a33 minus a n n x3 plus dot, 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 plus a 3 n x n equals 0, and all the way to the bottom two equations of a n minus 1 n minus 1 minus a n n x n minus 1 plus a n minus 1 n x n equals 0, and the final equation, which might look pretty obvious or redundant, or obvious or redundant, a n n minus a n n x n equals 0. So each of the x i's are unknowns. And we assume that the a's, the values of the a coefficients are fixed, whatever they happen to be. And since this, since this equation, a n n minus a n n is always going to be zero, x n can be anything because any uh, any element of the complex numbers times zero is going to be zero. So we can select x n to be one. If we do, we find that xn minus 1 equals negative a sub n minus 1n times xn, which we assume to be 1, over a n minus 1 n minus 1 minus a n n. And that, this is why we don't have repeated values, because we end up having division. And if this ended up being 0, we would have a very difficult time with this argument, and we'd have to 
start with a new argument, and that would take a lot longer, which allows us to solve xn minus 2, because now, if we know xn, we know an minus 1, n minus 1, ann, an minus 1, n, and xn. So that leaves only one unknown here, which we solved for. And thus, going up the chain in the next equation that starts with an xn minus 2 unknown, that will only have one unknown because we'll know xn minus 1 and xn. So we'll get xn minus 2 equals negative a sub n minus 2 x sub, x sub n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2n xn all over a sub n minus 2 n minus 2 minus a sub n n and so on until we solve for each xi in turn finding that x1 equals negative a12 x2 plus dot 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 plus a1n xn all over a11 minus ann which gives us a solution and shows that ann is an eigenvalue of a sub n this proves the result in our slightly limited scope because we assumed that the main diagonal values did not repeat and this in the next few sections, you'll learn some results that make this proof almost trivial, mainly, mainly based on determinants and this thing called the characteristic equation, which I won't get into now. But this is how you would approach this kind of proof with a more limited knowledge of how eigenvalues and eigenvectors work. And then there's the second theorem, which we won't prove because the book provides a very nice proof that you should read. And the statement of theorem two is if v1, v2 through vr are eigenvectors that correspond to distinct eigenvalues lambda one through lambda r of a linear operator t from rn to rn, then the set of the eigenvectors v1 through vr is linearly independent. And that's all I have for today. Thanks for watching.